Hello everyone, hello fellow users. Good late afternoon Europe, good morning America, good evening, good night to our friends in Australia and that corner of the world. My name is Federico. I'm a bioinformatician and I'm joining you from Mainz, Germany. It's my immense pleasure to chair this joint keynote today about communication for this global, very global edition of USR. I see that our speakers are already with me on stage, so we are pretty much all set. First things first, one of the things that make all of this conference taking place in such a smooth and colorful way is thanks to our sponsors. So before we start with the keynote itself, I kindly ask you to please join me in listening to what our sponsor, Absilon, is willing to share in this short message with us. And I work in Absilon. I've joined Absilon in April and I work as project leader. Today, I would like to show you an app this is the application that I prepared for our studio shiny contest. And actually it's not a typical app. It's a story. But before we start, let me tell you that the whole UI of this application was built with shiny fluent and shiny fluent is one of the packages that we built also here in Epsilon. So make sure you check this out later. And now let's start with the story. This is the story of Adam. Adam is an R developer and he's a bit frustrated recently. He's frustrated because he received an email from John, his manager, right before the weekend. In the email, John asked Adam to finish one very small task before client demo on Monday. So Adam checked the task and although he was extremely unhappy, he decided to take it and assign it to himself. And by the way, a small off topic here, look at this functionality. It's called people picker. And I must say, this is my absolutely favorite one from shiny fluent. So you need to check this out. So coming back to the story, Adam assigned the task to himself and started working on that. But as it usually turns out in such situations, the task was much bigger than expected and Adam needed to spend the whole weekend at work, but he finally managed to finish it and he was ready to present on Monday. Right when he was joining the call, he received a text from the client saying, sorry, Adam, I can't join the call, but don't worry, the priorities has changed, which actually means that what Adam was working on throughout the whole weekend isn't that important anymore. So I think now you can imagine how frustrated Adam was. And though it's not a true story, I think we've all been there. So if you want to change something, I would encourage you to check our careers page. We have plenty of open positions for developers and project leaders. So if you have any questions about our recruitment process, about the positions, don't hesitate to contact me. You can also find contact details to Paulina from the HR team at the bottom of the page. Uh, so if you prefer, you can also uh, contact with Paulina and I'm sure she will be happy to answer all your questions. And from my experience, as I also joined Absilon recently, I must say uh, I have very from the recruitment process, it was really smooth. Also later, the onboarding process, it's, it's really well organized. So I must say that Epsilon makes everything to make that process, which I think is a bit stressful for everyone, the process of changing your job. Uh, but Epsilon makes it as smooth and pleasant as possible. So I hope you feel encouraged. This is all from me today. Thanks a lot and see you on board. Thank you. And we are back all together. So again, thanks for joining me in this virtual round of applause for our sponsor, Epsilon. And let's go back to the main slide set and let me please introduce it properly to our next two speakers. We will hear about the importance of communication. So first of all, the topic, we will be working 
We all are working with data. We need to communicate results in an accurate and efficient way if we want our work to make a real impact. And therefore, this is what brings the values of a single analysis and the data contained in them to elevate it to make a real impact. So I am very humbled and at the same time honored to share the stage with two excellent speakers, which I incidentally share also almost the name. So it's going to be a Catherine and a Catherine. So you will probably not be able to dissect uh, who is who. So I kind of have a nice deal with them that it's going to be Catherine with C and Catherine with K. Our first speaker in this joint keynote is Catherine Gishero. Please, Catherine, join me on stage. She will provide us with the perspective of a veteran data journalist working, working mainly on gender, health and development issue. And she's joining us from Kenya. Welcome, Catherine. Good afternoon to you. It's Our actually, second... Sorry, it's actually seven, eight o'clock, almost 7.30. Okay, so it's so evening. It's no evening. worry, no worry. It's evening, anyway. perfect. Our yeah. second speaker in this joint keynote is Ka Catherine Hayhoe. She's an atmospheric scientist whose work is centered around what the effects of climate change are on the people and on the places we live in. She joins us from Texas, US. Welcome, Catherine. Good morning to you. I think I didn't butcher this one. Before we start, we needed to set up a kind of a few basic rules on how we would like to, you to enjoy this at best. Each of our speakers will first present their contribution in a consecutive way. And while they do so, we encourage you to ask questions already in the Q&A upvote the ones which have been already proposed or ask them in the, in the Slack lounge. So we will make sure that we use our time at best. Of course, we will uh, refer to the correct person. So follow the Catherine C and Catherine K nicknames if you want. And after the two individual talks, I'll be kind of opening up the, the, the virtual doors of our common living room where all the questions can be addressed to any of the speakers, maybe the same question to both of them, so that we can gain a lot of extra insight by cross-asking these questions. Okay, let's now uh, get the stage ready for Catherine. Catherine is an award-winning journalist. She is an International Center for Journalists Knight Fellow. She currently spearheads the Africa Women Journalism Project. She has been a co-founder of East Africa's first budget and public finance fact-checking and verification initiative called PesaCheck. And among her many acknowledgements over the years, she was recognized with a Courage in Journalism Award. Catherine, I look very much forward to your talk. Please, the stage is yours now. Thank you very much, Federico. I'm so glad to be here. And it's quite a privilege to join all of you in all your, in all your different spaces and in different times. I think the pandemic has showed us that we don't need to be all in one place to be able to have an interesting conversation. Uh, I just wanted to, today I will not be talking too much about what we, I mean, I'll definitely be telling you about how I see data journalism now, the uptake of data journalism in, uh, in our country as well as within the continent. So I'll essentially be talking about how data, how journalists are using data to tell compelling stories about the pandemic, but also how we can use data to tell compelling stories about many other issues. I just wanted to start by setting the scene by saying that journalists have always used data, except most times, most of the times, most journalists don't think that what they're doing, what they're doing is actually data journalism. And one of the things is that uh, the, the, con the concept has been data journalism, you need to have a lot of advanced computer assisted reporting equipment, which most of us don't really have. And actually, if we do have them, it's not in all the newsrooms. You need, you need to have uh, access in advanced uh, quantitative methods, uh, which again, not all journalists have and not most journalists have. And this has also, this has been a problem in most of our newsrooms. There is also a gender dimension when it comes to the uptake of data journalism in, in, in the continent. According to research that was conducted in Tanzania and uh, Zambia, for example, uh, the researchers found that a lot of women journalists were very skeptical about the practice of data journalism. And very few of them were actually interested in taking it up. Beyond elite news organizations like the Nation Media Group in Kenya, which is actually regional, 
and 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 and, and premium times in Nigeria, for example, even quite a number of news organizations in South Africa. Many of them are not yet introducing, the, most of these newsrooms are actually introducing data journalism, but in a very slow rate. And this is because they don't actually have the specific skills that are needed to be able to do data journalism. It is therefore something that is still in its infancy and it is still being received and its adoption is also being received with a bit of skepticism, a lot of curiosity, but also some skepticism. In many of our newsrooms also, the practice of data journalism is actually spearheaded by a core group of uh, a few champions who have the skills to adopt data journalism. That is one of the objectives that we as AWJP have in providing the women journalists we work with, with the skills, with the data journalism skills that they can then become innovators in their own newsroom. And we do this by making sure that they actually learn how to not only wrangle, but analyze, but also present data. The diversity of actors such as programmers, designers, illustrators are not available in most of our newsrooms and therefore data journalism is yet to become something that is internalized within our newsrooms. Again, just to set the stage in terms of the situation as far as data journalism is concerned, there, most of the data, the push for data journalism has been done or has been done with the support of international news, not news organizations, but actually civil society organizations or nonprofits who in negotiating their roles as in activism and advocacy have realized the importance of having journalists as mediators. And this has had an impact on the kind of journal, data journalism that is being done. Uh, for example, just like uh, Federico mentioned, I co-founded, I was privileged to co-found the, the PESO check, which is East Africa's first, first checking um, organization. And we did this with the support of International Budget Partnership because there was a dire need for informed reporting on public finance and, and budgets. And because of that, initially, the whole fact-checking was around fact-checking statements by public figures or even news, news organizations around the issue of budgets and public finance. And the idea is not only to inform, but to also hold those who are spending our tax shillings to account and being able to do that in a way that can personalize that information. Because as you understand, budgets are too con tend to be too dense in terms of numbers, but actually personalizing, being able to personalize that information so that people can consume it and be able to make informed decisions with that. Um, at the obvious start of data journalism or is, uh, I'll be able to share one of the, uh, sorry, just uh, give me a, uh, a uh, I need to share my screen with you so that I can be able to show you what I am presenting in terms of the con, yeah, here we are. Sorry, sorry about that. I have been, I've been talking without actually showing you some of the slides I had prepared for this. So you will forgive me if I am fumbling a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, let me share this with you all. I have, um, Aditi, maybe you can help me with the screen share of the slide three. I'm not that sure. Is yeah, slide three. Sorry, I wasn't able to, to, to get the, oh, here we are, okay. Yeah, share screen. Yeah, that's the one I was hoping for. Anyhow, the obvious, I mean, for me, the biggest challenge that has we face as data journalists is actually accessing data because most of the most of the um, data is usually collected by National Statistics Office, and the problem has always been that sometimes the data that government departments and government ministries collect, such as the, the Ministry of Finance, Communications, Transport, and all the rest, it's usually 
not accessible or it's not made available to, 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 to citizens or for that matter to journalists. And that tends to make it very difficult for journalists, especially if you're, you're interested in accessing data. And one of the other thing is that a lot of private sector organizations and even not for profit organizations have a lot of data. They do collect a lot of data, but again, access to this data is not available to journalists because it, they either share it amongst themselves or they share it maybe with government. But even then, sometimes they also don't want to share it with the journalists because it, they want to share with people who are able to pay for it because obviously there's a high cost in data collection. So I can understand why they are unwilling to share that their data freely, but it also makes it a bit of a challenge for, for most journalists who are interested in doing data journalism. Uh, in the early 2000s, I know all of you understand about the open data movement where most governments were encouraged to kind of make public whatever data they had in their in their in, in uh, they had uh, public data, to make public the data that they have been collecting about their citizens or about their whatever policies that they are implementing. Then the evolution of the open data movement was quite substantial, but it's still very far from maturity because finding data is often very unstable and very inadequate. We actually have a big challenge, especially in, uh, in, in like I mentioned, getting data. And then in the last few years, there's been this data for development mantra, which seems to have taken every government, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, every government is singing a song data for development. You need data to make uh, evidence-based decisions and all the rest of it. But what has been of concern is that amongst this, in, in the midst of all this, and because there's lack of the expertise internally, especially expertise in handling big data, the UN, among others, have been encouraging African governments and NGOs to work with US and uh, European-based private sector actors who seem to have, who have the expertise and the knowledge to work with big data. To, to, and and it, the idea here is to this for these governments to be able to work with this European or US based expert to be able to understand how big data can be used to improve their service delivery as well as monitoring in real time the, their development activities. As governments have been urged to do this, there's this question about where what, where the data is collected and the analysis is, 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 I mean, I can understand why governments would want to take up those kind of, um, that kind of urging from the UN and others. But then the problem with that is once this data is low, it's taken out of our continent and it's, it, it, it compounds the inequalities that already exist. And, and it means that we cannot do, we, we cannot develop homegrown expertise in big data analysis and also hampers the capacity of our innovators. For me, the real value of big data is not the data itself, nor this technical expertise, but really the analysis that we can give, we can, we can make about this big data and also be able to put, to bring on board local insights into how this data re references or impacts on our situation, not from some other understanding of this data. So for me, it's the happy marriage between the technical expertise as well as the local understanding that leads to innovative use of data. And that is now where, when you have this kind of data, being able to communicate what it means. And then the other thing is, even where the data is available, there are numerous gaps and, Unfortunately, this has come through, especially now during the pandemic, because a lot of the data we're getting is very general. It's not really granular enough to, for us to be, as journalists, to be able to actually understand what is going on with the pandemic and who is, where is, and how is this pandemic impacting on specific subgroups within the population or even especially the marginalized communities within our societies. And that, that has really kind of, you, you have this homogeneous reporting of data about the pandemic, but really doesn't give you granular enough details to be able to say, 
are the measures that the government is taking either to do lockdowns or to institute curfews or whatever it is, are they making sense? And, and how can we be able to inform or even critique whatever is the government is doing, especially as far as the whether it's the rollout on vaccines or whether it's the measures that the government is taking, are we do we have we don't have enough granular data to be able to understand that, and it also doesn't help us to say okay we have COVID in yeah for example we have COVID in Kenya yes everybody knows that, but where are the areas which are worst affected, and are there local measures that can be taken just to deal with that? place if it's a zone or a whatever because it's been very generalized information and the other thing is also i mean for me i've been wondering um when we are being told x number of people because we do get daily updates of how many people get affected or infected or whatever have been tested really tested and found to be positive but then the question is at this is the government including those who are who are symptomatic in those affected? Because they may have it, but they are not showing the signs of this disease. And then are they, are they all, they're not even telling us that those with underlying conditions being counted amongst the ones who are dying. I mean, we don't know. And it would really be informative and really interesting to be able then to say, okay, when you're told to do this, this is what it means if you have this underlying condition, not just to assume everybody, it's happening homogeneously to everybody at the same time in the same way. I mean, it would also help us in understanding why are certain measures being taken by the government. I, 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 I keep on grappling with this idea. We, the, at the initial stages, there was the curfews, there was the lockdown and soft or hard, whatever. Then we started easing the lockdowns. But then why, if we don't understand how this disease is spreading and where the are these general measures really having any impact other than punishing people, quote unquote, I'm using the word punish because when you have a county lockdown, a county is almost like a regional government, it's locked down, it means there's no movement in and out. What does that mean for people? Because we are all interrelated in all our different, the, in terms of economics, in terms of everything. Schools, for example, schools are about to be closed now, but one one county might be shut down because the, the spread of the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has become too too. It's too much. And but then the question is, how what what are those kids who are in boarding schools in those areas going to do if they have to travel out of there to go to their homes in other areas? Anyhow, to make a long story short, insufficient data makes it difficult for us to 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 work. But it, we have to. We generally have to sift through multiple reports to find trends. And in some instances, governments. Yeah, some governments have been downplaying the pandemic by doctoring uh, the data that they release. I mean, a good example is Tanzania, where actually there was no data being reported. There were no, there was no, there was no COVID because there was no, there was, but they were not releasing any data. I think the situation has eased up somewhat since then. But without official data, and then what? it meant is that the journalists we are working with, especially as well as other journalists in Tanzania, actually had to start reporting not about COVID cases or people dying from COVID, but actually looking at the high, insta you, you start and get, trying to find data around the high instance of maybe people who are dying from pneumonia or resp other respiratory diseases, or even using anecdotal information about night barriers. Not that there were, or maybe there were a few, but really we had to go that way because it's not possible to, it wasn't possible to get any data from the government. And they also made it possible, made it actually criminal offense to to report on any data that is not released by the government authorities. And the other thing is also in terms of the data we're getting, it sometimes doesn't have historical context. So you maybe get data that is been released in the last 24 hours, but not the one maybe last week or last week, but one. So you have to start looking for it and kind of just to show how, show how the trend is happening. But under the guise of uh, actually controlling information, some governments have also enacted laws. Again, I'll cite Tanzania because 
I think uh, some governments don't want to be criticized eh, the manner in which they are handling the pandemic. So I, I think Tanzania has eased up somewhat. So at least now we're getting data from their at least statistics, daily st statistics about the number of people hospitalized or affected or infected with, by the disease. I uh, will not go too much into the obstacles, but I want to say one thing. Despite all this, uh, I mean, in terms of accessing data in Africa, we can write a whole book about it, which I won't, but it will be, the, the challenges are not insurmountable, but, and I'm happy to say that we're able to somehow manage and get to, to, to do something as far as reporting and using data and communicating data with our audiences are. Despite all this, it is data journalism is growing, yeah, a pace. I wouldn't say fast, a pace. And I think the main attraction for this is the ability to be able to tell stories with uh, engaging visualizations. I mean, yeah, I can I can describe something, but I think a picture tells a thousand words is better than a thousand words. And for me, the ability to visualize and put these huge numbers or small numbers or context, contextualize these numbers into something that is visual is really, really um, attractive for us. It's just another layer of our storytelling. And I want to quote uh, Paul Bradshaw, who I believe is the one of the fathers of data journalism, when he was asked, okay, what makes data journalism different from the rest of journalism? And his answer was, perhaps it's the possibility that open up when you combine traditional nose for news and the ability to tell a compelling story with the sheer scale and range of digital information now available. Those possibilities can come at any time at any stage of the journalistic process, using programming to automate the process of gathering and combining information is one of them. Some newsrooms can be able to get a designer, a data analyst to assist in the interpretation, but for freelancers and small newsrooms who don't have the capacity or don't have the resources for that, they have to depend on either collaborating with people who have those skills, and that for me is, is quite interesting because then you have people who are non-journalists who are coming into the new space, who are coming into the journalism space because we have seen a need for their services where previously we may not have thought we needed them in our newsrooms. And uh, one of the uh, one way, like I mentioned earlier, AWJP, apart from training, we, we train the fellows as well as provide them with the skills to be able to do this on their own, hoping that they will become those internal champions in their newsrooms so that they can encourage the uptake of data journalism. I've been also uh, able, we've also been able to, 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 to get journalists to see the need to, to share, actually not only share, but actually to collaborate across newsrooms because one newsroom, one small newsroom has one skill, another small newsroom has another skill. If they combine the two skills together, they have a team. And it's not necessarily uh, how do you call it, cannibalizing the different newsrooms. It's actually being able to, to share what, 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 what you can be able to, to, combining your resources to do something together. Not necessarily uh, the same story, but actually, the skills that I need, one newsroom needs an analyst, another needs a, an illustrator, and both of them can actually work together. So collaboration is quite key to that. I am going to talk about the raw data itself is, oh yeah, actually I wanted to talk about our, I mean, a lot of us, when I talk about training people, we were in training journalists, most of us know how to use Excel and Google shit. And I'm hoping that uh, at least if you haven't got, I mean, most journalists at least know how to use an Excel sheet. And if they haven't, they're at least learning how to use that. But there's also something that I've come to realize that be, there's much more beyond the, that, that we can do with data, which a Google sheet and an Excel sheet cannot do. And I think for me, that is where learning a programming language, and I'm not saying R only, but R for journalists, it's the, it's, it's it's not difficult. I mean, if I can learn it, so can everybody else. I'm not a tech. I'm not a, a techie, but I'm saying I've never wanted to be a coder. But 
when I looked and working with Ara, I just said, okay, it's very intuitive. It's very, it's not very complicated and I don't need to learn too much stuff. I don't really want, and I'm not saying it's, there's anything wrong with learning it, but it's just that that is not my strength, but at least using R, it, it does come in handy, especially when we're handling big data. And, and the other thing is also it's, the fact that you're able to do interesting visualizations, there are very many other free tools which can help you do many interesting uh, um, visualizations and stuff. But the fact that you can use R for analysis as well as visualizations, that makes sense for me. And I really think it's one thing I can, I would encourage journalists to learn if just understand how it works, even if you're not going to have to do it every single day. But I think it's one of the things that can be that journalists can be able to do because apart from telling stories, we really need to be able to 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 kind of contextualize and maps and charts and stuff can help us do that. So with R makes sense. And also it means that we're able to communicate in a more, how do you say, granular level and and make people actually understand what that data says about them, what it means for them, so that they they need to care or why they should care. And I also think that for, 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 for data to resonate, we definitely need to be able to know who our audiences are. And sometimes you cannot be using charts all the time or whatever. And, and coming up with infographics, for example, it really makes much more sense than looking for stock photography or using just to be able to make people see uh, or even understand what the data is telling us or whatever information that you want to communicate. Uh, we've been able to use, the way we've been able to use data is we've been using data to highlight solutions where they exist. And sometimes they've really been interesting solutions uh, like this particular one where, I don't know how many of you know about the motorbike taxis. I mean, and during the pandemic, because women were not able, some women are not able to access sexual and reproductive health services, but they're able to communicate with their health provider, but uh, their clinic, and then, but they can't go, or they were not able to travel out or to leave their home. Then the health provider works with a motorbike taxi, a dedicated one, who then delivers this, uh, these goods and services to this uh, to the women. And I thought that was quite an interesting situation because who would have thought that you'd have to, you could send a motorbike rider to go and collect your, 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 your products, whatever products you want from your clinic, from your family planning or SRH clinic. We've also been using data to uh, we've been presenting data in a, an audience-friendly way. And the reason I use audience-friendly because when you look at how data is presented in um, in some of the international news outlets, for example, they, they take into account the understanding or the levels of comprehension or, or, or understanding that their audiences may have. So we are not dumbing down, but we are seriously not going into very intricate and whatever, just so that we make a point. The beautiful designs are not beautiful if they're not explaining anything or they're not telling me anything or not, not communicating anything. We've also been avoiding terms that are too technical. So we use terms that are in common usage. They may not be quote unquote, uh, I use the word quote unquote, uh, correct English, but that's the English we're speaking. So for example, care packages in Nigeria are known as palliatives. And for me, palliative means something totally different in Kenya, but it, it was something that everybody in Nigeria knew. Palliative were the care packages that the government was giving to the most uh, 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 affected, the, 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 the destitute and the poor. And we also avoid concepts that can be mis misunderstood. A lot of uh, science communication coming from government or even from the scientists themselves is talking about health surveillance. In our context, especially in Kenya, when you say surveillance, already everybody thinks it's the police. And you don't want people to be have a, to misunderstand that health surveillance is not, it has nothing to do with the policemen. It has nothing to do with the security agencies. Health surveillance means this. So you can't use that word health surveillance. You need to think of another word to talk about that. 
So we've also been explaining how, how data impacts on our audiences by saying, okay, for example, in one instance, looking, so if you have X number of people who've been affected, what does that mean in real terms? What does that mean for me? So we also work with the uh, present data in distinctive ways so that people can actually get it, we get the attention of uh, the communities. We've also been using data to debunk claims, and I know a lot of you know about all the misleading, uh, mis the, the infodemic is the word that has been going on. So we've been using data essentially to debunk a lot of claims, and we try and do this by not necessarily taking sides and telling people, you are wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, but actually adopting a, how do you call it, a diplomatic way of telling somebody actually what you're saying is not true, and this is actually what it is. So you don't preach at them, you actually have a conversation, persuade them into the truth of what it is that you're debunking, because obviously when you tell me I am wrong, I'll just become stiff and refuse to listen to what it is that you're telling me about. And then we've also found that a lot of people find it difficult to understand standard data presentation formats. So we've been using, obviously, telling stories in more engaging ways. It's not the usual. And actually personalizing, humanizing them. And one thing that we've found is that once we personalize and humanize the, the data, then people actually can engage. So in this instance, for example, we're talking about the number of women who are not able to undergo fistula operations because of the pandemic. That means they continue leaking and all the rest of the madness that uh, goes along with the, with the fistula when you have a problem with fistula. And one of the things that happened is that the community, several communities in Ghana then, where especially where these women were living, got together and decided to at least build them proper facilities and make sure that they have access to water and because you need to keep cleaning yourself up. And also a few CSOs started uh, engaging with the government to not to to lift the suspension of the fistula operations because they said it's selective. I mean, fistula operation is not elective surgery. It's, it's a matter of life and death, dignity and, and the womb, if you want to call it that way. So really that was, I mean, it, you, you, you need to be able to tell these stories, using the data to tell these stories, what that means for them. And it, I mean, the other thing is also in terms of um, like the story we did on the blood, a lot of people are not thinking about it, but we do get a lot, most of our blood in our blood banks in most of our countries actually comes from students. And because the schools were closed, there were no blood drives. There were the blood donor campaigns that tend to happen every month, usually targeting school children, school, I mean, uh, secondary school students and university. When we closed down the schools and the university, it meant that we had no way to get those kids, not really kids, those young adults to contribute or to donate blood, which meant that the blood bank is in trouble because we are always under our, most of our blood banks don't even have enough blood on other times, in other times, but now it was quite acute. And then you still have the same number of women needing blood because they have, they've been bleeding when they're having babies with, you know, all the needs for blood. And especially now with malaria, children under five requiring blood. So when people, when you tell those, the numbers, what it means, then you say, oh, really, I need to be able to do something about that. So we also share, obviously, what I said earlier, which is actionable information so that people can be able then to make a decision, what are we going to do about it? And one of the stories we did was about the open air markets and how they are centers of the super spreading, I mean, they're the super spreader sections of our community because nobody is enforcing the wearing of masks or the hand washing or the basic whatever. And that got a lot of attention. And I do believe that it, 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 it made a difference. For me, I just want to end by saying one thing. Journalists, we have to acknowledge that we don't have, I mean, we don't have all the data. And as, especially with the pandemic, we know it's evolving and things, the situation is changing so fast. And, and, and what we know today is 
nah, next week will not be will not be the same. So we really need to be able to understand that what is important today may not be important next week. But and we need to be able to tell our audience or our readers actually cite the date of the data we are quoting because if I got data of last year, this year the situation has changed. So if I'm making assumptions or making I'm drawing any kind of conclusions based on data that is dated in the sense that it might be not current, then we need to be able to tell our audience that so that they know and understand why the that, that understand the constraints and why it's not a definite because the situation may have changed by the time that you've actually done that. Uh, I also want to end by saying that turning messy, incomplete and reliable data into credible journalism is a very demanding task. And it's also very frustrating. I keep on saying frustration, yes. Especially when we have to fight just to get the data, access to reliable data so that we can be able to inform people. Because at the end of the day, if citizens don't get the correct information, they're not able to get to make informed decisions about issues that actually have a bearing on their lives. I mean, it's a matter of life and death. So yes, communicating data is important, but we need the data and we need accurate data and reliable data to be able to effectively communicate. So I want to end there. I'm sorry I've, I've taken too long. Thank you, Federico. I'll welcome any questions. No problem at all. I, 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 in these cases, these are the moments where I don't mind going one or two minutes over time because it's, uh, I'm, I don't know, I'm in awe of your competence and of, your, of the heart that you put in this. So I, also in that interest, I would probably not kind of stop this flow of, uh, I don't know, feelings and content. I will keep the questions for later where we all okay. join together. And I will basically call on stage, first of all, thank you all again. Thank you, Catherine, again. Thank and you. call on stage Catherine K. And while she shows up, I will also take a few minutes to also introduce her properly again. So again, the Q&A is the way to interact with our speakers at best, and then also upvoting and uh, the upvoting mechanism is the best way that we can actually make sure that we ask the most voting questions. So our next speaker, Catherine Hayhoe, or Catherine Kay, as she kindly allows me to call her. She is an, an atmospheric scientist. Her research is focused on understanding how the climate change actually affects people and the place where they live. She is an endowed professor of public policy and law at the Texas Tech University. She has been named one of the Times 100 most influential people the United Nations Champions of the Environment, and also a World Energetic Alliance Climate Ambassador. So, and I'm kind of asking myself, what am I doing here, introducing her to this? I'm probably here for the same passion that we have about data and communicating that. And in all of this, she really solemnly guaranteed that she uses R for her daily work, even if we won't see a code chunk in her talk today. Code, uh, so a talk for which I'm very much looking forward to. So please, Catherine, the stage is all, all yours now. Thank you so much. And that is absolutely true. I am an R user. I was converted by a statistician. And even though people have tried to persuade me to move to MATLAB or Mathematica, I have resisted. I still use R. Please do resist. So, yes, <laughs> I am. So my research is based on R. The data analysis that I do uses R. But what I'm talking about today is I'm actually building on Catherine with the C's talk to talk about not only how data is important, but what type of data. Because sometimes it's not enough. We think we've provided everybody with the data that they need to make a good decision. And people say, ah, I don't think so. How can we change people's minds? Well, I study climate change, which is the most contentious, difficult, thorny, complex issue that there is currently on science. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna answer that question focusing on climate data. And let me put this into full screen mode here. All right. I want to start off with just highlighting, picking up where Catherine with a C left off, how data is very important. 
because, in the famous quote, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And of course, the original quote said his, but it relates to everyone. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. You can say gravity isn't real, but if you step off the cliff, you're still going down. On climate change, the facts are very clear. We know that climate is changing. Humans are responsible. Scientists agree. The impacts are serious and there are solutions now. We have known the simple facts of how people are changing climate since scientists from the 1800s. Yes, the data that shows that our planet has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases that keeps us over 30 degrees Celsius warmer than we would be otherwise. But by digging up and burning coal and gas and oil, we are producing more heat trapping gases that wraps an extra blanket around our planet that we do not need. The data proving that and proving that that is why the warm world is warming was collected and analyzed in the 1800s before they had computers, let alone R. We use R though today to do all kinds of analysis. And one analysis we did a few years ago was there are thousands of studies, thousands that agree that climate is changing and humans are responsible. But in the last 10 years, there were 38 studies that found that that was not the case. So we took those 38 studies and we reanalyzed every single one of them from scratch using R. And what we found was that every single one of those 38 studies had at least one error in it. Sometimes it would be a mathematical error, or a calculation error. Sometimes it would be a false assumption or an important factor that was left out. But every single study had at least one error that when corrected brought that study into line with the thousands of other studies that have been published in the last 200 years showing that climate is changing and yes, humans are responsible. Because of the data analysis that scientists have been doing for decades and even centuries, it was 1965 when scientists were confident enough that climate was changing, humans were responsible, and the impacts were bad, to warn a U.S. president. That president was Lyndon B. Johnson. And now the headlines look like this. Expensive wildfires, record-breaking heat waves, sea ice melting, flood losses, hurricanes devastating entire islands. So people often ask, did climate change cause this event? And that is not the right question because we've always had hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, droughts, floods, heat waves, storms. We've always had those. The right question is, did climate change make it worse? And by analyzing the data, we, are we can answer that question. We can show, and this is a brand new headline from yesterday, we can show that climate change made the North American heat wave from British Columbia down to California last week, 150 times more likely. It made the devastating Australian brush fire season from January 2020 30 times more likely. Climate change was responsible for at least $67 billion worth of the damages from Hurricane Harvey. Climate change is driving migration crises in many countries, including Bangladesh. When we analyze the data, this is what it shows us. So if that's the case, why are we not treating it like an emergency? Right? Because it is. Well, to understand this, we have to go to the social sciences, not the physical sciences. Tally Sherrod is a neuroscientist. And she writes in a book that she wrote called The Influential Mind, she says, our brains are programmed to get a kick out of information. But when we give people new information, they typically only accept it if they already believe it. If it contradicts what they believe, their brain shuts off. And she goes on to say, the wealth of information available in this internet era makes us more resistant to change because we can just go on the internet and we can find a YouTube video about anything that says that we're right. I'm paraphrasing here, but you get the idea, right? And even worse, as we're exposed to contradicting information and opinions, polarization expands with time as people get more and more info. Dan Cahan is a social scientist from Yale who studies political polarization. And his research was prompted by the fact that for years now, climate change has been the most politically polarized issue in the whole U.S. 
And I'm sorry, the width of the gray bar is how polarized things are. And you can see climate change is right up at the top. This was before COVID. So what happened after COVID? They redid this study last August. And here's what they found. And this time it's not in the order of the width of the gray bar. So I'll point out number three, two, and one. They redid this. And now the coronavirus outbreak is the number three most politically polarized issue. Race and ethnic inequality is a number two. And climate change is still number one. So Dan studies this and he said he found that it has nothing to do with intelligence. People with the highest degree of scientific literacy were not most concerned. They were the most what? Polarized. And in fact, he went on to find, and I'll translate this into English. Being smarter doesn't make you more accepting of the data. It just makes you better able to cherry pick the pieces of information that show that you are right. Now, this reaction is not invoked when we're talking about issues that aren't politically polarized, like what? Like dark matter. If you give people information on dark matter, most people will nod and say, okay, and they won't argue. They might not remember it, but they won't disagree. But on very politically polarized issues, which now sadly include COVID and include climate change, if people already have an opinion and you show data that doesn't agree with their opinion, they will reject the data rather than rejecting their opinion. And this is not only in the United States. I know you might be thinking, well, I'm not in the United States, so why is she talking about this? They did an analysis across 56 countries, and they found that what people think about climate change is not influenced as much by their education and their experience as it is by their ideology, their worldview, and their political orientation. And across 64 countries, they found that when people who are politically liberal are more educated, they're more concerned about climate change. But in wealthy countries where people have big carbon footprints and use a lot of energy, if people are more conservative, the more information they get about climate change, it only makes them a little bit not more worried, not a lot, because political ideology is interfering. So what happens is climate changes and we get worried if we follow the data, how could we not be worried? So often what we do is we simply share more scary data, but that just causes people to reject it even more. And inaction results and climate changes even more. As neuroscientist Tally Sherratt says, she says fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. So this type of data is not moving the needle any more than it already has. How do we break this vicious cycle? By sharing the right kind of data. What do I mean by that? Well, the real problems we have with climate change is not that we think that 200 years of physics are wrong. I mean, the same physics that explains why climate is changing explains why airplanes fly and why stoves heat food. There's not a lot of people who say that stoves don't actually heat food or airplanes don't fly. There's probably one or two, and you can probably find them on YouTube. But in general, most people would agree that basic physics is real. The real problem we have is we don't think climate change matters to us, and we don't think there's anything we can do to fix it. To put it another way, our threat meter is unbalanced. We think the climate solutions are bad, and we think the climate impacts are far off and they don't really matter. Whereas in fact, what the data says is climate solutions are good for us, short-term and long-term. They clean up our air. They give us clean water. They create jobs. And climate impacts are bad for us, and they're right here right now too. So how do we address the sense of disconnection? Well, these maps show what it looks like. I actually want to give you a picture of what this disconnection looks like. Across the United States, and this is just an example, but we do see similar patterns in other rich countries. Across the US, most people will say, yes, climate is changing. Anything that is, any county here that is orange means more than 50% of people said yes, and the darker color, the more people said yes. They ask people, will it harm plants and animals, a different species? And people say yes. Will it harm Oops, sorry. Will it harm future generations? Yes. Will it harm people in developing countries? Yes, probably. 
And then they say, will it harm you? This is the biggest gap we have. The gap between people who think that climate is changing and it will affect other species, future generations, and people who live far away, and the people who say it will affect me. And if you're wondering about the yellow counties, there's some people groups who are more concerned about climate change than others. One of the most concerned people groups in the US is Hispanic Catholics, and another is Native Americans. So that's part of what you see there in terms of the pattern. What we're looking at is something that is known as psychological distance. The idea that a risk of anything, a risk of heart disease, a risk of not saving enough money for retirement, a risk of climate change, is distant in time, future generations, not now, distant in space, over there, not here, abstract global average temperature instead of what's happening where I live, and irrelevant to things that I care about. Of course, all of these are false. Climate change is here, it is now, it is affecting us in very real ways, in ways that matter to all of us. It is not just about the polar bear, it is about us. So how can we communicate the data in ways that directly connect with people? Well, Catherine C. alluded to this. It's by telling stories that are what? That are here rather than over there, that are now rather than the future, and that are relevant. It turns out neuroscientists have found that when we tell a story, people listening to us, their brain waves actually synchronize with ours, and we're able to empathize with each other rather than only sh sharing data by itself. So for example, and this is, these are examples of data I work with. We can say heavy precipitation has increased across the United States. And we can show the percentage increase by region of the United States. And we can talk about um, how it's already happened. This is in the past. But how much more powerful to connect with people by telling stories of what's happening, the Midwest flood of spring 2019. Here is a farmer whose fields were flooded. Here is a homeowner who lost their home. What's happening in China? They're putting up sandbags on the edge of the lake because of the flooding. When we make it personal, when we make it here, when we make it now, we engage with that data at an entirely different level than if we're just showing colored areas on a map. This one's even worse. Sea level rise. All we have here is some colored lines and they're nice rainbow colors. They look attractive, they look pretty. You think, oh, sea level rise, hmm, feet. Let's see, two, four, six, eight. Well, that sounds interesting. What does that mean? What that means is we have 700 million people living within a few feet of sea level. Where are they going to go? What that means is there is literally ocean water on streets that people are driving through now during high tide plus sea level rise. Cities are elevating the level of their streets by two feet. Two feet, look at that. They're building up the streets to prevent sea level flooding. We know that properties, the price of properties are dropping. And it's people like Zillow and real estate companies that are telling us this. This brings that data home in a whole different way because we're not talking about meters, we're talking about dollars, we're talking about feet, we're talking about things that are happening where we live. Here's an even more esoteric one. The oceans are warming in units of exajoules. Now, I don't think anybody could really identify with that one. I mean, people would be like, what is that? Why does it matter, oceans? Of course it matters, but why? It matters because coral reefs are being bleached during marine heat waves. It matters because toxic algae is on the rise as oceans warm. It matters because hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons, they're all the same type of storm, they're just called different names in different parts of the world, they are all powered by warm ocean water. And so these hurricanes are getting bigger, they're intensifying faster, they're getting stronger, and slower, and they have a lot more rain associated with them. And we are able to put numbers on how much worse climate change made it in dollars, and maps showing the area flooded in a city that would not have been flooded if the same hurricane had happened 100 years ago. That's the type of data that connects directly. What about temperature increases? I study how different carbon choices on the left lead to different temperature increases on the right. But we might think, oh, one, two, four degrees Celsius, that doesn't sound like a lot. 
It doesn't until we start thinking about what that looks like where we live. The heat waves that people are enduring literally today, record-breaking heat waves leading to massive die-offs in marine life, hundreds and even thousands of human deaths, all kinds of infrastructure damage, crop damage. These are relevant and those colored lines on a figure do not convey them in a way that allow people to connect with them. But analyzing data at the local scale in ways that matter does. And of course, wildfires are getting bigger, burning more area as well. Why do we care about climate change? We care about it because it affects everything we already care about. Our water, our food, our safety, our economy, our health. To care about climate change, we literally only have to be one thing and that's a human living on this planet. And every single one of us are that. It's not about the polar bear on the iceberg. Yes, polar bears are affected, but after the polar bear, we're next. It's humans there on that iceberg so to speak, metaphorically. We are the ones who are at risk, and that is what the data shows very clearly. It gets really interesting, though, circling back to that whole political polarization. This is Chris Chu. He's a researcher at my university, Texas Tech. You can see I like to show you the pictures of people so you know who they are. And he's found that when we talk about climate impacts in a way that is here, not over there, in a way that is now, not the future, in a way that is relevant to us, that matters, that engages with the things we already care about, it turns out that that not only decreases psychological distance, it decreases political polarization too. Because we are connecting over something that is important to us that we agree on, rather than, dis than connecting over something we disagree on. Isn't that amazing? But there's one more piece, and I don't want to stop without this one more piece, and that is the fact that many people just feel helpless and paralyzed. Even when you convince them it matters, they don't know what to do. In the United States, 50% of people feel helpless when they think about climate change. Over 50% don't know where to start when it comes to climate action. This global survey of countries around the world um, feel like I could be doing more or my country could be doing more. A lot of people are less than 50%. They really don't have a sense of what could be done. This is a word that social scientists call efficacy. Efficacy is the idea that if I do something, could it make a difference? If we do something, could it make a difference? Most people, when it comes to climate change, would say no. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a president. I'm not a prime minister. I'm not an influential person. I'm not a rich person. I don't think I can make a difference. And so that's the last piece of information we need to share because people need to know that as individuals, we can make a difference. So I like to share information about what all kinds of different people are doing, whether it's new technology to show that yes, our technology is changing, the fact that countries are acting, phasing out coal, divesting from fossil fuels, why? Not because the prime minister decided to do so or the president, because individual people decided and raised their voices and said, the world needs to change. Corporations are changing, but why did they change? Was it because the CEO decided? No, it was because people who work there decided that it had to change. They used their voice within their sphere of influence to say, we need to do things differently. Young people are using their voices and they're changing the world too. We know their names, we know the Fridays for Future, we know about it because they are using their voices to talk about why this matters. The world is changing. Last year during COVID, 90% of new energy installed around the world was clean energy. Some of it in some of the poorest places in the world where people don't have access to fossil fuels. But if we don't know that this is happening, we don't feel like we could ever make a difference. And so that's why it's so important when climate changes and when we get worried to break the cycle. How? Rather than dumping more scary data on people, break the cycle by showing how it affects us and how there are positive solutions. And this creates a true positive feedback loop researchers like Matthew Goldberg have found, where the more we know, the more concerned we are, the more concerned we are, the more we talk about it. People feel empowered rather than frozen, and action results. To quote Tali Sharat one last time, our brain is built to associate forward action with reward, not avoiding harm. So we need to reframe what we talk about so the information we provide induces hope, not dread. Data is important. 
But data alone is not enough. We have to think about how to share it, what to share, and how people respond to that data. Because only by doing so will we truly be able to communicate what that data contains. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was a roller coaster of say information, emotion, because I was basically flowing with you on this and I wish you didn't stop now somehow. Uh, yeah, so now it's time to actually ask you something. And while our audience might already be start typing some questions in the, in the Slack lounge or in the q and I do have one provocative question for both of you. I just found a tiny uh, genie lamp and you have one wish, a small realizable wish that could make a change, make an impact in what you do. What's your wish? Let's start with Catherine C. Uh, you're both muted, Catherine's. But... So if you are, uh, you, what one wish I have for? To, to something that could improve what you do on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be a too big change or it can be a very big change, but something that can really improve what you do. I, I think it's actually being able to access information, being able to make it possible to give more than what we, just lessen the struggle to get the good information that we can be able to use to communicate with people, to let people know what is happening. I mean, save me the time of having to go from point A to point B to point three just to get one fact. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think it, 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 it takes so much of our energy, yet we could be doing so much more. And I, I think the strain and the stress and the agony of going through this this is what really kills a lot of uh, our ability, or oh, it takes our energy out. So yeah, that's I, what I would do. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a bioinformatician, totally different core of science from yours, probably, but I know the pain of having to access uh, research data and say, the, upon reasonable request, when I see that, I kind of get uh, this kind yeah. of reaction. So I, I kind of, uh, yeah. Okay, Catherine K, what's your wish? Well, I know that if you ever get one wish, what you wish is that all your wishes could come true. Yeah, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a cheap one. So I know, but I thought about it. Okay, so I mean, other than, you know, an extra hour to the day and things like that, um, I, it, if, if it's not too big, um, I think that we really need the sustainable development goals. They're so basic, no hunger, no poverty, gender equity, clean water for people to drink, affordable energy. If that's too big, if we have to go even smaller than that, I would say we need a price on carbon because we're producing so much damaging carbon and the pollution, just the air pollution alone is responsible for 9 million deaths a year, let alone climate change. I didn't even talk about the air pollution or the health. If we just had a price on carbon so that polluters paid, the people who were polluting this planet actually paid for what they were doing, and that money was used to, first of all, get them to stop. And second of all, to help the people who are suffering. I think that would be a small, very manageable, practical first step towards actually fixing this problem. Okay. Thank you for making it say small and, and manageable as, as a wish. Uh, <laughs> there are already some questions from the Q&A. So I'll take one from Eva Retamal, which asks you, where can we learn more about communicating in a way that empowers people? goes uh, say let's let's keep the like, let's keep the catherine c uh the catherine c with, with a c catherine with a k uh, order if you if you if you don't mind oh okay so the question is where you can learn how to communicate data in a way that empowers people yes okay i i think i always tell people that google is your friend and there are quite a number of people who are doing interesting and very very useful work. I mean, very interesting stuff online. Uh, but I, for as a journalist, I always use the data journalism handbook. It's quite interesting. And 
not only that one, but I actually try and get this, understand the concepts of the principles and then apply them within my situation or in your situation, because there's no way you're going to get the kind of, uh, in terms of data, especially if you're doing data journalism, for example, and you want to be able to communicate it, it's not possible to get all, but there are some some ways of, of uh, some skills you can learn of, online, but there are also skills you can learn from uh, going to school, maybe, if you want to do that, communication classes. But really, I just think, break it down to this way. I always tell people when I'm writing or when I'm they're writing, tell it to your grandmother. How would you tell it to your grandmother? It's a very, very esoteric, very complicated, like Kathy was talking about, climate change freezes you or releases you because of how you understand it and 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 for me is break it down to simple ways how would you communicate it to your mother or your grandmother and my grandmother not because she's not able to read but she can read but i want to break this very complex thing into something simple mm -hmm. then we can have a conversation then it's personalized it's it's not this complex animal out there yeah. so you just think about it that way how would you tell it to your grandmother yeah, I, I can and, also say... And why should she care to know? To you, if kids you as well. What? So you then the next question I ask is, so what? After this, so yes. what? What do you want her to do? Or what, yeah. do, what do you want her to feel? So think about your messaging and what it is you want them to get out of it and what it is you want them to know and what it is that you want them to feel after... Even if it's gloom and doom, we're all going to die, but you are going to die with a smile on your face because that's the fate of it. <laughs> Sorry. That's the way I look at it. Communicating information is... You need to connect, guys. Sorry, I've been... <laughs> that's true. Okay. Yeah. I, I've seen Catherine nicking, but say, if you want to add something more on this? Catherine yes, K, I, yes. I completely agree. So for me, I always literally thought about my grandfather. How could I tell yeah. this to my grandfather? Yes. And why would he care and why would anyone else care? So yeah. when we have these conversations, and I put a link to my TED Talk in the Zoom chat, and if anybody else is interested, you just Google my name and TED and you'll find it. Um, in my TED Talk, I talk a lot about communication. And I say the, the place to start is not here. It's here. That's the place to start. Figure out what the person or people who you're talking to care about. Like today, you notice we were both doing this. We all care about data. So we're, we're starting by talking about data. I have begun conversations about climate change by, by talking about food, by talking about knitting, <laughs> by talking about the place where I live, by talking about the fact that we're both parents, by talking about the fact that I love snow. So if we can begin a conversation on data with something that connects to people's hearts so then they understand why it matters, then step number two, connect the dots to the data but then step number three, talk about what people can do in response. Because if you tell people that there's a problem and they don't know what to do about it, we tend, our human um, defense mechanism is just to dissociate. I mean, if I told you an asteroid is hitting the earth and you're not a NASA person, you don't work for a department of defense, there's nothing you can do. What are you supposed to do with that information? We need to empower people. So our data needs to connect to the heart provide the information people need to understand why it matters, and then empower them to act. Perfect, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, connected to this somehow, we just mentioned how to actually deliver data. There is a, there is a question from Jesus Castagneto. How do we deal with the cherry picking of data and the interpretation bubble when talking to people that we know and interact with? Is it a question of how to approach the matter or the way the information is is conveyed, or and dot. I, I continue his dot dot dot. So I mean, I had a point about internet being a very, say, way too large resource of information or misinformation. Is it a bad thing to to have or a good thing to have? And so, how to actually curate this kind of? Uh, I, I wouldn't say cancer, but how to to create this sickness of being able to find data that would support a negationist theory just for the sake of doing it. So to, ma to make it short, uh, how do we deal with that? With this? Actually, this is a very huge thing 
and it can be a, a very big obstacle to against the work that you do actually let's start with you katrin c the one thing i know is that you you start off with a hypothesis and then you look for evidence that will either prove your hypothesis to be true or it totally kills your story in the sense that you get evidence or data that tells you no you're not going this way you should be going this way and for me it's to be open minded to the fact that this is what i think is happening and this is the evidence i'm going to look out for but if i find evidence that is showing me the other side of this thing i need to be open minded enough to to accept that what i started out with may not be true to be proved wrong because Human usually we want strong. to be proved right yeah. and you you have a deadline as a journalist you have a deadline you have to hit it on the head and then you started off with an interesting hypothesis and you know yeah evidence ba 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 if i really wanted to be a horrible journalist i'd just go with the evidence that is partially proven but it's not the whole story and i'll be found out anyway and it's human nature like kathy says to just want to believe what you as a people or like ourselves or whatever but i think the the beauty of learning and the beauty of understanding thing is to be able to to push the limits of what we think we know and look at what is coming in which is telling me what i know is not true and then being able to engage with that being open minded enough to be able to engage with that because at the end of it you'll just be in that bubble of yourself and why the why i keep on saying the internet makes it possible for you to access all manner of information why the hell are you limiting yourself to one lane one small portion get everything that is there for you it's free anyway and all it can do for you is broaden your mind and if you still want to insist there's no climate change that's your problem but there's evidence and other information but let it come in let it let let your mind be enriched by whatever is out there not just what it's like what we say unless you travel you don't know there's there's somebody else who can cook better than your mother so in this case is the same thing with your mind let all that is there come in it illuminates what you know and shows you some dark corners of your mind which are totally not they need to be illuminated and given some fresh air sorry as an yes, italian i, I hardly it, believe i hope i respond to your issue yeah but as an italian i hardly believe anyone cooks better than my mother but uh, <laughs> you need but, to travel that's why you're talking but i did travel yes and yeah. uh, so human as a, have a strong confirmation bias that's say even i i know about that even if i'm not a psychologist what's your <laughs> point uh, on this catherine Well, I actually have a Twitter thread specifically on this question. I will post it after we're done. So if you just follow me on Twitter, you'll see my thread there. I'll po- I'll repost it in uh, 15 minutes or less. Um, but I wanted to share a story about a colleague of mine named John Cook. He's from Queensland in Australia, and he had a father. Every time he went home for dinner, his father would say, "Oh, John, there's more polar bears now than there ever were. So how could the planet be warming?" And he would look up the information he would explain to his father how no polar bears really are endangered and he ended up creating a website called Skeptical Science that lists every single zombie myth about climate change and gives a full scientific answer with citations to all the scientific papers to every one of those 198 myths skepticalscience.com Do you think it changed his father's mind? No, it didn't. because it wasn't scientific information that was the problem. So John went back to school. He got a PhD in cognitive psychology. He has become the world expert in debunking misinformation. And I put a link to his YouTube channel in the Zoom chat and if you're listening not on Zoom, Google cranky uncle and John Cook and it will pop right up and there are amazing videos that he has studied on how to debunk this information. And what do you think happened with his father? Well, it turned out that there was a rebate on solar panels in the rural area where his father lived. And so John explained to his father how much money he would save if he got the solar panels. 
So his father got them and he saved a lot of money. And he started to tell John every month, look how much money I saved. I'm saving all kinds of money. And it made his father even more conservative, even more shrewd, even more thrifty than he was already. So it reinforced his father's identity. And a few years later, John was talking to his father and his father said, oh, global warming. Of course, I always thought that was real. And John said he almost fell off his chair. Because not only had his father changed his mind, but he had forgotten that he'd ever denied it. And did you see my bill this, this month? Look how much money I saved. So because he was able to help his father be part of the solution, the denial disappeared. So rather than addressing the denial directly, if we can work around it and help people see how they can be part of the solution, often the denial evaporates. But there's some people who will never, people who are dismissive, 7% of people in the US, maybe three or 4% in Europe and the UK. There's certain people who just won't listen long enough. And so for them, Coco Chanel said, you know, don't try to turn a wall into a door. You know, if, you, if you're not going to be able to, to get through to them, don't waste your time on those 7%. So again, and my Twitter thread explains who those are, but for everybody else, if we can connect from the heart, if we can help people be part of the solution, we can often get them to go, move past the disinformation. But if we address the disinformation directly, it's like we're playing a game like at the carnival or the fair. There's a game called whack-a-mole where it's like a mole pops up and you hit it with a hammer. And then as soon as you hit it with the hammer, what happens? Another one pops up and another one and another one. It's just a whack-a-mole game that never ends if we try to address the disinformation directly. I heard it yesterday in a course, uh, grant me the power to change a thing I can change, the exit of strong to, accept what I can, what I cannot, and the wisdom to dissect between the two of them. So that's the, probably the part that you don't hear, that hear as a third one. Okay, it's probably actually related to this one and also related nicely to a platform such as the R universe, but let's call it any open platform that can actually enable data journalists to have an opinion supported with data and allow them to share their written work, the figures, along with the code, so making a full reproducible work out of it. And would that probably strengthen uh, the opinion or say, let's say, the, the, the message that one wants to carry and change the opinion of such person or a, a small percentage of these? This question was asked by Kim Martin. Catherine, see. So working with journalists to be able to, 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 to collaborate with journalists to be able to produce data or to support their narrative storytelling. Is that a question? Uh, something like- I may have misunderstood you, maybe- No, you can... no, no, it's, uh, it's, it's probably the wish of a platform, of an open platform that can basically have, I don't know, let's, let's imagine just like a, like a server of, journalism stories that are supported with data where the output the the, the code and the, and and the, and the input itself are all available i mean we are all familiar of of these things working it with r but would <laughs> something like this second like open platform from journalism how strong would that be i paraphrase the question i think it would be really useful because like i mentioned earlier there is a lack in terms of expertise within our newsrooms and journalists themselves don't have that kind of expertise. So it would really be helpful to have that kind of collaboration and also being able to, to share, because I think in terms of what we're producing or the data we're using or the data maybe an R user is using or has, has access to or whatever, it would really be useful. I think it would be a useful thing. Okay, Catherine, Kay. Um, yes, but as, as someone commented on the Q&A here too, I also think it's important to have a platform where people understand and see what's happening, how solutions work and positive stories about that. And there's actually a really interesting website that's starting to do that called Bright Action, where they allow communities, which can be physical communities like a city, or they can be communities like virtual communities like the Episcopal Church of America, where all the members of the community can connect and they can talk about what they're doing and what works and what doesn't work and they can track what they're doing and they can add up the cumulative impact of their collective action in terms of reducing their carbon or having conversations or actually accomplishing 
um, different specific steps. So I, I'm a big fan of making data available and there's all kinds of data and numerical data is only one kind of data. I would also add two people are commenting, I'm not on Slack right now, but I'm going to go to Slack as soon as we're done and answer more questions there. So if you put a question on Slack and you're looking for more feedback from me, you will get it. Just stay tuned until we're done. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. There is another question. So uh, basically you pick up on the point of Elisa, which mentioned about say the power of showing positive solutions. Way too often we focus on the problem and not giving the hopeful, of course, it's a scary scenario what we are facing or what we might be facing soon. So uh, I'll just hijack the Q&A by, by asking, what else does it still need to happen before people really think that this is happening? Climate change, but also all the issues that are somehow connected to misinformation, what happens in Africa right now. How long does it still have to take before we start believing that these are real things? Okay, I, I, I think when it comes to misinformation, oh, sorry, Cathy, you, why are you going to? No, it's okay. Can I go? Okay, uh, I was just going to say, when it comes to getting the story, connecting to the story, whether it's climate change or whatever, like I say, Ours is to be able to make people care about what it is that we're reporting on or what the issues are. And when it comes to misinformation, again, don't go ahead, don't, don't tell me it's a lie. Hey, I won't believe you, but most likely I'll I'll be I'll be persuaded if you explain to me why 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 what I'm thinking is not be diplomatic about it. So for me, it's literacy, what I'd call um, I don't want to call it literacy, some so patronizing. It's actually getting people to understand and to learn how to be able to identify or to, to identify what is and what isn't good information and why it is bad information. It is also being able to explain to people why. Well, okay, for example, we are facing very cold weather in Nairobi. It's extremely, it's nine degrees right now, nine degrees Celsius. We don't do Fahrenheit, but I mean, it's extremely cold for July even. Normally we would not be this cold. And everybody, I need to start, we need to, I mean, telling people what this means, why we do not have any more potatoes or the potatoes, we are not going to be able to get potatoes or the price has gone up because of blight and it's hot, cold. So where they grow potatoes, the potatoes. So you need to break down things into, you break down some of these issues and explain to people in ways they understand and break them down and make them personalized yeah. and also educate people in learning how to understand the different good things, bad things, true things, not true things, slightly true things, you know, because it's all across the board. So they're, they're able to do that for themselves because journalists and fact checkers, we have too few the um, the armies of misinformers are bigger than the army of truth seekers or truth tellers. So we will never win. So the people consuming the information, if you can inoculate them against this by showing them how the same way we are protecting ourselves by wearing masks, blah, blah, blah. Same thing we should do for misinformation and blood information and getting people to understand why I have to wash my hands, how to wear a mask, all that. It's it's common sense. I mean, it's it's cheap. It, I don't I don't want to call it cheap, but it is the most obvious thing to do. Yeah, I don't know well, why we're not doing it. I know, no but it's not happening. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Catherine, what's your, what's your what's your take on this? Absolutely. I mean, John Cook, who I mentioned before, he actually literally talks about inoculating people against misinformation. And their teaching critical thinking is one of the most important things we can do. I actually created a brand new class for my students about critical thinking, just teaching them how to evaluate sources. So yes, the internet is a big place, but there is good and there is bad, and we need to be able to tell the difference. And it's important for all of us to educate our children, our students, our coworkers, people we know, to be able to critically think and examine our personal biases, like you said, our confirmation biases, our opinions in the light of data. So this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you, everybody. And yes, I'll answer a few more questions on Slack later this afternoon. Okay. 
Great. I think we are kind of running out of time and I wish this was not just one hour and a half. So, I mean, with this call to, to increase our level of data literacy, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us, I think this is one of the ways that we can really make our work have an impact and for real and for good. So without sounding like a preacher in this case, I mean, it's... We, we, this is probably the, the best and most powerful way that we have in our hands as worker with data that we can use to empower people and make our world a little better. So I hate to say this, but we probably really have to wrap it here. And um, yes, the best part of it, you can still interact with our speakers in the lounge Slack and where you can make sure that no question stays unanswered. For this, once again, I am more than thankful to Catherine C and Catherine K for the time and the insight that we were able to share. And next will be a recharge session. So I wish all of you a further pleasant use our global. Thank you. Thank you.